Welcome to Doug Fabian's Top 10 ETFs for 2015, presented by Fabian Wealth Strategies, a fee-only investment advisory firm specializing in exchange-traded funds. Doug Fabian is the president of Fabian Wealth Strategies, with a career in financial services spanning over 35 years. The information contained in this presentation is for educational purposes only and is not intended as personal investment advice. Hello, this is Doug Fabian. I'm the president of Fabian Wealth Strategies, and I'm here today to present our top 10 best ETF ideas for 2015. Thank you for joining me. I'm recording this presentation on February 12th of 2015, and my purpose is to give you solid investing ideas for your portfolios in the balance of this calendar year. Today, I'm going to be presenting five ideas for income investors and five ideas for growth investors. Uh, by no means should you look at these ideas as a specific recommendation to buy or sell any security. Uh, my purpose here is education and information. Now, some of these securities are owned by clients of Fabian Wealth Strategies, and I will disclose when we are holding one of these securities in our portfolios. But my whole purpose here is to give you good ideas for you to be able to further your research. Uh, those of you who listen to my podcast on a weekly basis know that I just returned from the Inside ETF Conference uh, in Hollywood, Florida in late January. And some of the ideas I have today to present are from that conference, and I'll reference that as we go through the course of today's presentation. I'm basing these ideas on some specific investment themes, and I'd like to go through those investment themes with you right now so you have some sort of context for how these investments would perform under different market conditions. To begin with, we believe that we are going to continue to see a strong relative strength of the U.S. dollar. Now, the U.S. dollar had a banner year in 2015. It was up some 15 percent, uh, excuse me, in 2014, up 15 percent. I'm not expecting that we would have another huge year like that, but do believe that the U.S. dollar will be stronger throughout 2015 than the other big currencies, the euro and the Japanese yen. Next, we are, believe that interest rates are going to remain stable throughout calendar year 2015. Uh, as of today, the 10-year Treasury bond is yielding uh, 2%. Uh, when I say steady, that doesn't mean we won't have some price fluctuation, uh, but I expect that the 10-year Treasury yield is going to remain in a range. Uh, and the risk of significantly higher long-term interest rates in 2015 is low. Uh, next, uh, we believe that the international markets are going to outperform the domestic markets. That does not mean that we're expecting any new bear market uh, in 2015, but we do believe that the underperformance that we've experienced during the last several years in the international markets uh, is going to reverse, and the international markets are going to have a year that is better than U.S. equities. And then... I want you to understand that, you know, there are many cross currents in the world today uh, and we have to take a kind of a tactical approach in some cases uh, rather than a broad based approach. And I'll mention the emerging markets for a moment. The emerging markets are still struggling and emerging markets indexes uh, include countries like Brazil and South Africa that are uh, commodity oriented and in a rising U.S. dollar environment, commodities are challenged. But when you look at specific countries like China and India, which are still considered emerging markets, uh, the prospects for those markets to perform well in 2015 are quite high. Uh, also, when we take a look at individual sectors, uh, we still believe the technology sector has a lot of potential in 2015, where the energy sector is going to be challenged. Uh, so, we believe that a more tactical approach is going to be beneficial to investors. And then I want to mention that the world of innovation is still in play here in the United States. There is no country in the world that has the entrepreneurial and innovation spirit like our country does. Uh, and all of the big breakthroughs, uh, I shouldn't use the word all, the majority of the big breakthroughs in patents, uh, in research, 
uh, in innovation are still coming from the United States. Uh, and I believe that that's going to continue, and it's certainly uh, continuing in the world of exchange-traded funds. I was recently contacted by an investor in Canada, and they uh, asked me about investing in United States ETFs and their problems for foreign investors investing in U.S. ETFs. So I went and searched uh, the number of exchange-traded funds that are available in Canada, and there happens to be about 400. Uh, but by comparison, the United States has 1,600 exchange-traded funds available. And certainly there are basic ETFs available in almost all uh, markets of the world today. The exchange-traded fund product is being adopted by every country. But the United States is still where the innovation is. And I'm going to be talking about some very innovative products today that deserve your attention. So with that introduction of our investment themes, let's jump into my presentation and take a look at this first chart that shows the uh, S&P 500, SPY, uh, the uh, emerging market, EEM, and the uh, developed market ETF, EFA. Now, the black line is SPY, and you can see on a four-year basis, this ETF is up some 60%. Uh, EFA, which represents international stocks without any U.S. exposure over a four-year period, is up almost 30%. And then on a four-year basis, the emerging markets are actually down. And so that's the relative performance of these three markets. Now, I want you to understand something. Historically, on a 30-year basis, these three markets perform almost identically. And the leader on a 30-year basis is the emerging markets. So one of my premises is that markets have a tendency to return to their historical means. And this is my premise general premise, simple premise, is why I believe that the international markets will outperform the U.S. markets. And I'm more fond of the developed markets than the broad emerging markets uh, uh, that we'll talk about as I go through the course of my presentation today. Uh, so countries that uh, are, you know, Japan and, and uh, uh, Europe, other developed markets are Canada and Australia. Uh, those countries do have the uh, ability to be able to outperform the U.S., uh, and I'm going to give you some investing ideas in this area. The broad emerging market indexes, as I mentioned in the investment themes, are still being weighted down by this strong dollar, uh, slowing global economy, and the negative effects that it's had on commodities, particularly energy. And we all know about the decline in energy prices. We all know about the energy glut that is in play in the world economy. And if the world economy starts to pick up, those trends will reverse. But right now, those trends are still in play. And so uh, we will monitor them through the course of the next, um, you know, uh, 10 and a half months. And uh, we're not going to, you know, leave you with just this presentation and walk away. Of course, each and every week on my ETF Strategies a weekly podcast, uh, I'll be updating these investment themes and talking about changes in market trends and continuing to update you on what's going on in the financial markets each and every week. Uh, if you would like to become a member of my inner circle, which are those investors, and there are 4,000 of them, who listen to my podcast each and every week, receive a weekly email from me, you can go to Fabian Wealth. Dot com and sign up for the weekly broadcast to be pushed to you. Just give us your email address and we'll push you a link each and every Friday when I update the financial markets on what's happened in the past week and I give investing ideas on a weekly basis and also talk about personal finance issues on a weekly basis. Moving on now to uh, this evidence that I have here on the U.S. dollar commodity chart, uh, pretty surprising here, these relative trends. The black line represents the U.S. dollar, and this is a lengthy period of time. We're covering one, two, three, four, five years. Uh, you can see that the U.S. dollar on a four-year basis uh, was relatively flat. It is only in the last you know, six months that the U.S. dollar has had this huge lift, this 17% rise in value. And you can see this blue line is representative of DBC. This is the ETF of a basket of commodities, mostly 
And DBC is about 50% energy, oil, natural gas, those kinds of energy components, and it has fallen significantly. But you can see back in uh, 2011, when the U.S. dollar was weak, commodities were very strong. So now we have a strong U.S. dollars and commodities weak. Uh, so we're not expecting commodities to come roaring back here in 2015. Certainly we'll monitor that and, and things change. We'll update that uh, opinion over time. But I wanted you to see that if the strong dollar trend continues, the weak commodity trend is going to continue with that. Now, if we do get more strength in the, in the global economy, uh, that would really go a long way towards helping commodities, and we'll monitor that. This next chart is a chart of interest rates, 10-year comparative interest rates between the U.S., Japan, and Germany. The red line is the U.S., and you can see that the 10-year yield is uh, just slightly under 2%. And you can see that the green line, that is the German yield, is down at in the 30 basis point range along with the Japanese yield. Now, you know, U.S. citizens, for the most part, don't travel aggressively abroad or, or regularly abroad. I shouldn't use the word aggressively, regularly abroad. Uh, so we really haven't seen much of this currency change in our day to day lives. So certainly, we've seen lower gas prices, and that's been great, now, but no other real change in our lives. We've certainly heard talk about the strong dollar, these kinds of things. But if you're a Japanese investor or you are a European investor, you have seen dramatic swings in the value of your currency. And if you wanted to purchase uh, goods and services from the United States, they are significantly more expensive than they were two years ago. So... Uh, these trends are firmly in place, and of course, these interest rates are reflective of the strength or weakness of these other economies. And of course, Japan is embarking or has embarked or is implementing the most aggressive quantitative easing program in the history of the planet, and they're continuing to do so. So they are aggressively printing money and buying bonds and doing all that they can to try to spur some life into the Japanese economy. And it's certainly helping in some ways and in some places, but it's still a uh, nervous time for Japanese uh, uh, leadership and, and Japanese citizens. They're, they're not growing at 2 or 3% like the United States economy is growing, and that's what they want to do. And, of course, in Germany, uh, where we have the same situation. The German economy is in pretty good shape, and the weaker euro has actually helped the German economy. Now, that's the economics. Let's talk about it from an investor's point of view. All investors have a certain percentage of their money that they want to keep safe and they don't want to expose to risk. They don't want to invest a certain percentage of their money in the stock market, especially when it comes to uh, wealthy investors or pension funds, these kinds of things. So when you look at these comparative interest rates on the 10-year, it just makes complete sense for German and Japanese citizens to buy 10-year Treasury bonds in the United States because you can go from earning 0.4% to 2%. Well, that's a difference of 500%. Uh, you can earn so much more interest in the United States than you can in your own country, and you're invested outside of the U.S. dollar when you hold U.S. Treasury bonds. I read a report yesterday that uh, of the last auction of 10-year treasury bonds, 56% of it went to foreigners. So there is great demand. And I know every time I talk with an individual investor, they're worried about higher long-term interest rates and they're petrified of the bond market. Well, I'm making the case here, not that the U.S. 10-year is going to collapse down to 40 basis points if we went into a recession or something bad would happen. That, that would be the outcome. But the U.S. economy is relatively strong right now and is growing, uh, so that's good. And, you know, the Fed is getting raised, ready to raise short-term interest rates, and that's part of the reason why the U.S. dollar is strong. But this trend in interest rates is going to continue, and I expect it to continue in a sideways fashion, where the 10-year Treasury bond is going to trade sideways in the United States. It could go down further. It could go up slightly but it's not going to go up dramatically because 
there's so much demand for U.S. Treasury bonds from overseas investors who would rather not be in the euro and not be in the yen because they're losing value. They'd rather be in the U.S. dollar. So that's the case for stable U.S. interest rates. Now, with that backdrop, uh, let me get into talking about some specific investing ideas. And I've got five ideas for income and five ideas for growth. Uh, And I've got several slides on each idea. And as I mentioned, I'll mention when we have a position in uh, the Fabian Wealth Strategies client portfolios, uh, I'll disclose that. My first investing idea is the Mortgage REIT ETF from iShares. The ticker symbol is REM. And this is a yield hog. This is a big yielding ETF. The current yield on a 12-month look-back basis is a yield of 14%. Now, I'm not expecting that this ETF would yield 14% for all of calendar year 2015. I would expect about a 12% yield uh, from this ETF in this next calendar year. Uh, And in a stable interest rate environment, the the risk with the mortgage rate is higher long-term interest rates and higher short-term interest rates. So we're not expecting higher long-term interest rates. And short-term interest rates, the Fed is talking about raising interest rates one quarter of 1%. So that's the equivalent of, you know, virtually nothing. So the risk, the the risk to a security like this uh, is rising interest rates. But my case is we're not going to have rising interest rate. So this ETF, which is a high-yielding ETF, which we do own in Fabian Wealth Strategy portfolios, uh, is a, a good position in an income portfolio. Now, the position size, and again, I'll talk position size as we go through things just to coach you, position size matters on something like this. This is not a security where you take a 20% of your overall portfolio in this, this high-yielding, volatile ETF. Uh, This would be a 5%, 7%, maximum 10% kind of allocation. Uh, And it is volatile in terms of its price, but it pays virtually 1% per month in income. Pretty nice. So you can pair this, meaning match it, a 12%, we'll just call the yield 12%, even though it says 14, 12% yielder with, you know, at 5% with a... uh, 15% 15% allocation to a to a to a 4% bond and you get a blended yield of about 7%. So it really adds some value to your portfolio and this ETF is trading at the low end of its range uh, and I believe that there's the potential for capital appreciation. So uh, my expectations are with this ETF that that it could return on a total return basis, price appreciation and yield, 12% yield, 8% price appreciation is 20%. So it has that kind of potential. This next chart is a price chart. And one of the things I've done with this particular price chart is I've removed the income. And you can see that it's trading at the low end of its trading range when you remove the income from the, from the uh, price chart. Uh, and I like this ETF in this you know, $11.50 to $11 range. Uh, so uh, give that some thought. The next idea I have is um, the PowerShares Closed End Fund Income ETF, PCEF. Now, this is also in the portfolio of clients of Fabian Wall Strategies. This ETF yields almost 8%, 7.95%, and it is a portfolio of closed-end funds. Matter of fact, there's 146 closed-end funds in the PowerShares Closed-End Fund Income ETF. The great thing about this particular product is it makes it easy for an individual investor to be able to get involved in closed-end funds, and have liquidity, meaning you can get out of them much easier than you can get out of individual closed-end funds that trade at premiums and discounts. Now, what I want to focus you in on on this uh, fact slide is the second column 
uh, second block of information that says average premium discount. Right now, all of the securities within the closed end fund universe are trading at an 8.2% discount. That means that they're, they're on sale. They're trading under their fair value. That's an indication to us that since most closed-end funds are income-based, most investors are still worried about rising long-term interest rates. And that's the wrong thing to be worried about. But that puts us at an advantage. The 52-week average yield in this space is 7.6%. So we're under the average yield. The 52-week high yield is 6.4, and the 52-week low yield is 9.6. I know these are a lot of numbers, but I'm just letting you know that this particular security is on sale. And again, looking at you know what its potential is in 2015, we can get an 8% yield. Maybe we get 5% or more capital appreciation, but let's just say we got 5%. That's a total return of 13%. I think that's a very good opportunity. This next slide shows the price chart of PCEF, and you can see that it did uh, fall off the last half of 2015. Uh, that's when we added it back into our portfolios, and we've just moved above the blue line, which is the 50-day moving average, and that's showing some nice price stability, the fact that we've got a bottom in December, and we're going the right direction. So then this next slide is a slide on the double line total return fund DLTNX. Now, you you're thinking to yourself, Doug, you said that that this presentation was your 10 best ETF ideas. And the reason why I have this placeholder of DLTNX is that this is the fund and again this is another position that is in the portfolios of clients of Fabian Wealth Strategies. Uh, this is a core holding for us, so we have a larger allocation to this particular security than any other security in our portfolio. Uh, but Jeffrey Gunlock and the Double Line Group have teamed with the State Street Group, the Spiders, and they're coming out with the Double Line Spider ETF any day now. So now we're going to be able to get Jeffrey Gunlock's strategy in an ETF. So I'm using this... Uh, slide as a placeholder and letting you know that, of course, as soon as this ETF is available, I will be telling the world uh, that it's available because I think it's going to be a great investment vehicle for us. And Gunlock and his team have just done an outstanding job of navigating these fixed income markets. Uh, this ETF is going to yield close to you know the 4.4% yield that the uh, fund is the mutual fund is currently paying. Uh, but he's actually going to have a little bit more flexibility with the ETF in that he can invest in international markets, emerging markets, uh, treasury bonds. He can go. It's it's a opportunistic strategy that he can go almost anywhere with. And uh, the firm just has great traders and they do a great job of managing assets. And I would uh, highly recommend that you uh, look closely at not only the double line mutual fund, but the double line ETF when it comes out. Uh, this next slide is a chart of the double line mutual fund. Uh, this is a chart. I've removed the income, uh, so it does show some price volatility, but uh, this yield, the total return on this mutual fund in calendar year 2014 was uh, almost 7%, just under 7%. And uh, it's been doing good again this year, and uh, I believe it's a very nice spot, a, a, a cornerstone of our portfolios. Uh, the next ETF idea I have for you in the income category is the First Trust Preferred Securities and Income ETF, FPE, Frank Paul Edward. FPE is a preferred stock ETF. The majority of the assets are preferred stocks. There are some corporate bonds in this exchange-traded fund. Uh, there is a nuance in the world of preferreds. Uh, and not to get too complicated, but some preferred stocks have an element within their makeup that takes into account duration. And rising long-term interest rates can be a negative for preferred stocks. This 
ETF, the way it's structured and because of its holdings, has a shorter duration than most preferred ETFs. This is one of the reasons why we selected it, because we think it can be something that we hold for years uh, in our portfolios. Now, a preferred stock ETF, you know, most of these companies are financial-oriented companies. The yield on this ETF, 5.8%. I think we can do 6% and get some total return. Maybe we can get 8 to 10% out of this position in calendar year 2015. We do own this for clients of Fabian Wealth. Uh, and I want to now take you to the price chart. And you can see the price chart shows a nice rising uptrend, very little volatility. That's the key with preferred stocks. In a normal world, in an ongoing bull market, Preferred stocks are very low on the volatility scale. They don't bounce around a lot. It's not like common stocks. Take a look at the month of October. Well, this ETF barely moved in September and October, and that's a month, two-month period of time when stocks actually fell 10%. Well, this ETF didn't even move the needle. Low volatility. It is at a 52-week high, but I'm expecting that you're just going to continue to get very low volatility and get your income, and everybody's going to have a happy day here. The risk with this exchange-traded fund is a recession and a bear market and credit problems. Well, we just don't have that on the horizon right now. Certainly, that could materialize, uh, but FPE, a very good income position in one's portfolio. And the last idea I have for you is an international dividend ETF, the Spider S&P International Dividend. Now, the first observation I want to make regarding this security is the fact that dividend stocks in the United States are near all-time lows in terms of their yield because the stock market's near all-time highs. So if you take a look at DVY, which is one of the most popular dividend ETFs of U.S. securities, it's yielding less than 3%. This ETF is yielding almost 6. So you can get a 100% increase in your dividends by owning international equities. That's a big deal. That's a huge value proposition when you compare U.S. dividend stocks to international dividend stocks. Now, when, you, when we take a look at the price chart, you can see that this ETF really came down quite sharply in the fourth quarter of 2014 because it's got 23% of its exposure to oil and gas, and oil and gas stocks were down 30 to 40%. So... There's a reason why this ETF uh, has had had fallen so sharply, but now it's starting to really gain some momentum and uh, starting to emerge into a new uptrend. So check out the price chart on DWX, and you can see the big fall that it had, and we're back now in 2015 into a new rising trend. And this ETF on a year-to-date basis is up almost 7%. uh, But I think it has real potential uh, in calendar year 2015. So those are my five ideas for income investors uh, in uh, 2015. I didn't try to come up with the five highest yielding or the five top performers or something like that. I came up with the ideas that I believe fit into our macro view of the world today. And some of these ideas are low risk, decent yielding. Some of them are a little higher risk, higher yielding. But I believe that these ideas uh, will uh, prove to be solid investing ideas throughout calendar year 2015. And of course, I always advocate uh, Uh, managing downside risk with a stop loss or sell strategy. So, you know, depending upon your own philosophy, uh, that should be incorporated into your thinking if uh, you want to manage downside risk. Okay, let's move on to talking about growth ETFs 
in calendar year 2015 or for the balance of calendar year 2015. And the first idea I have to share with you is one of those innovative ideas that has come out of the ETF industry that is, I don't want to call it, say it's unusual, but it's, uh, it's really a, a, a great strategy. And this is the uh, Deutsche Bank IFA index. And remember that the IFA index is Europe, Australia, the Far East. So it's those international stocks, Japan, UK, Switzerland, France, Germany. Uh, and there's 900 holdings in this security. But what makes this unique is the fact that they have hedged away. I know that that's a complicated term. And hedging almost sounds like an expensive term. But they have hedged away the currency risk. Because if we continue to have a strong dollar, that will be a drag when you own international equities. And again, for instance, if we invested in a European ETF and it was up 20%, but the euro was down 20%, you would make zero. But in a hedged currency situation, if you were up 20% and you hedged away the currency risk, you could be actually be up 30 or 40%. So zero versus 30 or 40, we know the answer. So hedged currency funds are quite popular right now. This fund has over $3 billion in it, and uh, they've really done something very innovative. Many advisors are moving their clients out of unhedged international ETFs into hedged ETFs. So let's take a look at the price chart. And you can see that the price chart, the price has been volatile. Europe has been volatile. Uh, the markets have been volatile, especially in October. You see that big swoon we had, another one in December. Uh, and now we're near a 52-week high. I, I'm, this is an ETF where I have to give you some buy parameters. Uh, and certainly you could buy it at the 52-week high. I would really like to get this ETF in the $27 range, which would be a pullback of about 5%. Uh, I don't like normally buying something at a 52-week high, uh, but um, uh, that's just for information purposes. This next slide really shows the difference, still talking about DBEF, the Deutsche Bank IFA Currency Hedged ETF, versus EFA, which is the unhedged version and look at the difference in four-year performance. First of all, four years ago, there wasn't much difference between one ETF or the other because there wasn't this big move in the U.S. dollar. But since the U.S. dollar started moving so much stronger, there is a huge relative performance difference. On a four-year basis, EFA has gained a total return of about 17%, and DBEF has a total return of 45 percent you want the 17 you want the 45 i know the answer so that's our first equity idea dbef the next slide is a slide of the iShares india 50 the nifty 50 in the country of india and what they've done is is taken the uh, 50 uh largest stocks, best growth potential. Uh, iShares has set up a screen to to uh, focus in on 50 particular securities in that country. And this is a compelling emerging market idea for your growth portfolio. Now, let's talk position size again. A DBEF is the kind of position that could be 10, 15, 20% of a growth portfolio, where the iShares India 50 is something that might be a 5% position. So it's just a smaller position. It's going to be more volatile, has excellent growth potential. Uh, and just a few facts on India. First of all, you know that there are some countries that have really benefited from this fall in energy prices. And India, China, Japan are three countries that were massive oil and, and petroleum product importers. And so the high price of oil, oil at 100, was a drag on their economy. 
well, oil at 45 or 50 is a windfall for their economy. So this is very beneficial to China, Japan, and India. Another fact that I was introduced to at the ETF uh, conference was the demographic fact with India. And in an economy uh, that's going to, you want to grow long term, you want to have good demographics. And good demographics is a, uh, a younger population that has the ability to grow a bit older, you know, and, and earn income and, and grow your economy. Unfortunately, the country of Japan has one of the worst demographic situations in the world, and Europe does not have good demographics either. The U.S. is okay, but India is killing it. 25% of all people in India are under age 25. Huge growth potential. Last year, there was an election in India. They brought in a new prime minister. They have a new head of the central bank. They're making a lot of good decisions Infrastructure spending is going on in the country because it is third world when it comes to its infrastructure. So the idea is India, the ticker symbol INDY, uh, and it's an emerging market play. Let's take a look at a price chart. You can see this ETF came down and touched the 200-day average in December uh, and once in January. Now it just corrected back to its 50-day average. This is not a bad entry point right here. So INDY is, is uh, another idea we have to share with you on the emerging markets. My next idea is the Guggenheim China Technology ETF CQQQ. And I know if you've been listening to my broadcast, Fabian, uh, the Fabian Well Strategies, ETF Strategies with Doug Fabian podcast, you know we've been all over China. And we recommended the China A share and it's it's in our client portfolios. It's done great for us. Uh, We've had a lot of success with our China recommendations. And here's something new. Now we do own this in client portfolios, uh, the CQs. Now to give you some comparison, you probably have heard of the ticker symbol here in the U.S. of the QQQ. It's the NASDAQ 100, the largest 100 NASDAQ stocks. This is a similar idea in China. It is a technology internet idea for the Chinese economy. Many of these companies are based in Hong Kong as well. Uh, This ETF has not had the big run-up that uh, A-Share has had. So this is closer to its 200-day average right now, which is a good entry point. Uh, You can see that uh, the stock of Baidu is in this ETF. Uh, so, you know, there's a there's a lot to be said for the growth potential. Realize that the Chinese economy is now the largest economy in the world. Uh, and we believe that uh, China is going to be a top performer going forward. And here's a way to be able to invest in their technology companies. Price chart on CQs. Uh, You can see that it's oscillated around its 200-day average, uh, recently just broke back above, and um, uh, we do own it in client portfolios here at Fabian Wealth. My next investing idea is is kind of a contrarian idea. Uh, It is the Market Vectors Junior Gold Miner ETF. Now, the idea behind this ETF is that gold has the potential of making a, a good move here in 2015. Why? Because, you know, hey, usually strong dollar is not good for gold. But since November, the U.S. dollar has been strong, gold has been strong. The logic behind that ties to countries like Japan, uh, the region like Europe, where they've had a lot of currency fluctuation, and gold has been a great currency hedge in those countries. Uh, I actually had the uh, ETF providers for market vectors in our offices this past week, again, collecting more information. Uh, There's a lot of buying of gold going on in India and China as those economies are starting to pick up. Uh, So there is gold demand, uh, but this is a play on a market sector that really underperformed last year. 
This ETF was down 20% last year, calendar year 2014. Just emerged into a new uptrend. Uh, if you were to enter this, and this is a volatile play. This is a play that can be up 20 to 40% in a matter of three months, but can also be down that much. So pretty easy to set a stop loss at uh, 24 and take advantage of the idea uh, if we do start to see a bigger move in gold prices. Uh, we do own this for Fabian Wealth Strategies clients, and we bought it in January. The last idea I have for you for growth investors here uh, is the First Trust Internet ETF, ticker symbol FDN. FDN. Uh, and the just take a look at the top holdings here. Google, Amazon, Facebook, eBay, and Priceline. Those five stocks represent 36% of this portfolio. So if you just want to be overweight internet stocks, that's the idea here with this ETF. We do own this for Fabian Well Strategies clients. Uh, we own this in our growth portfolio. It's a growth-oriented ETF. It's not providing you any income. Uh, and we still believe that the technology, internet, uh, the growth strategies of these companies uh, is still positive in calendar year 2015. So it's a pretty simple, you know, kind of internet play, if you will. Take a look at a price chart. You know, this ETF has definitely, you know, been volatile. Uh, it's been above and below its 200-day average, uh, but we are now just kind of back in breakout mode here. Uh, just about with FDN, and uh, it's an ETF that I can uh, uh, solidly say I think is a good idea in calendar year 2015. Uh, relatively easy if you entered it to be able to set a stop loss at its recent low uh, and be able to manage downside risk. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, I've given you five ideas for income, five ideas for growth, uh, realize that the one double line total return mutual fund idea is to set the stage for when the ETF comes out. And it could come out any day now. They're in the quiet period. They can't even talk about it. That's because it's almost like an IPO when this thing uh, finally launches. Uh, but there will be a lot of press on it when it does. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, having access to the double line strategies in an ETF format. So uh, definitely give that a look. The five ideas for growth. Only one of the five ideas for growth is U.S. stock market based. And I say that because in, you know, statistically, the U.S. stock market is at the high end of its valuation range. It's outperformed all these other markets these last few years. Uh, the investing public is is on board in a big way in the U.S. market, uh, and I believe now it's time for some other markets to shine, and we've given you some ideas in that vein today. Lastly, let me share with you some action steps and let you know that Fabian Well Strategies, our team of advisors, is here to be able to help you if you need help. Uh, and I've been doing many portfolio reviews, me and my team, uh, this uh, first few weeks of calendar year 2015. But here's the process we go through when we do a portfolio review for you. First of all, we sat down and talk about your goals and objectives and get a review of your assets and your income streams. We take a look at your current asset allocation. We talk about risk management, if there are any particular portions of your portfolio that stick out to us as higher risk. We're going to discuss that with you. But the big value from a conversation with us comes when we talk about repositioning cash and underperforming assets. Uh, when we do a portfolio review, we do discuss the wealth strategies, talk about your trust, talk about your retirement plans, talk about your legacy plans. So if you feel as though you need help, if you feel like you cannot pull the trigger uh, that's the biggest issue that I've had with most of my recent conversations with people. They cannot pull the trigger. They cannot make a buy on a new idea. Or they buy too small. Uh, then I believe that a conversation with us uh, and 
uh, a discussion about your goals and objectives, your wealth strategies, your portfolio, you would benefit. So I invite you to contact us. You can go to our website and send us an email. Uh, The uh, phone number here, 800-391-1118. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me today. My topic, the 10 best ETF ideas for 2015. I hope you give these ideas some consideration. And I look forward to my next broadcast and my next discussions one-on-one with you. Have a great day. Thank you for watching Doug Fabian's Top 10 ETFs for 2015. For assistance with your retirement income plan and a comprehensive portfolio analysis, call 800 391 1118 or email info at fabianwealth.com.